How do I pronounce this star? Well, that's a good question. So I ran a Twitter poll and the answer is nobody seems to know. Well, you're an astronomer. What do you say when you're at an astronomy conference and someone says, so, Professor Merrifield, what do you think about the latest happenings on Bidigulus? Uh, I, I don't go to that kind of conference because I don't do stars. It's difficult because it's a corruption of an Arabic name. So actually, quite how you're pro supposed to pronounce a corrupted Arabic name, I'm not sure. Um, so you can really pronounce it how you like. But let's go with Beetlejuice, shall we? It's a star. It's a relatively massive star, about 10 times the mass of the sun. It's, if you look at the constellation of Orion, which is one of the few that most people recognize, it's the star at the top left of, Or of Orion. And the reason why everyone's excited about it is because it's fading at the moment quite dramatically. Uh, and the other interesting fact about it is that in astronomical terms, it's likely to blow up sometime in the near future. And people have kind of put these two facts together and equated the fact that it's fading at the moment as a sign that it's about to go. Wow. <laughs> is it about to go? I think it's unlikely. So I, I was a bit careful in what I said, in, in that I said in astronomical terms, it's going to go pretty soon. And that just basically means it's probably going to blow up sometime in the next 150,000 years. So the chances of it being tomorrow are pretty slim, I would say. It's actually well documented as a variable star. It has some sort of quasi periodic things. There's a longish time scale variation. There's a shortish time scale variation. So there's lots of variability going in it, on in it. It is a complete mess. And so actually, although this is the faintest it's been in recent times, it's not really unprecedented for it to be fading. If and when it does blow up, will that be preceded by a sudden and dramatic fade? Nobody knows, because no one's ever seen one of these things that close up and seen it before it blew up to know what it's going to do. So no one really quite knows. And the reason, part of the reason why no one knows is because it really is a very messy system. It's big, extended, bloated kind of thing. There's all sorts of processes going on in it. So quite what the sequence of events would be that you'd actually see from the outside is really something of a mystery at this point. Huh. I thought we modeled stars all the time and we've got all these theories about what the explosion looks like and how a supernova works and like it will supernova presumably. It will be a supernova. And yet you're right, you know, we sort of have a broad brush understanding and the sort of the physics that's going on. But it's like, you know, it's like the difference between climate and weather, right? That actually, even if you think you know what's going on in the climate, you don't know what tomorrow's weather's going to be like. And really what's going on in the outer layers is very much the weather. And the, the, the climate is the explosion that's going to occur right in the core of it. And how these two things are coupled together is really quite complicated. So we really don't know what you'd expect to see in the days, months, years leading up to the explosion. Because before this Betelgeuse stuff, if you'd asked me, Brady, what do you think happens to a star in the year or two or the week or two before it blows up? I would have said, oh, I bet it gets really, really bright. And if you'd asked me the same question, I'd probably have said the same thing. You'd think that that would be the, what would be going on. But as I say, it really is because what's going on right in the middle, where there are probably are some pretty frantic nuclear processes going on right in those dying days of the star, and what you actually see in the outer parts are really only very loosely coupled together. So it really isn't that clear what you'd end up seeing in those last few weeks. But you think, like if you're a betting man... I'd be prepared to put a fair amount of money on it not going in my lifetime. Which would be a shame, because I'd love to see it, but uh, no, probably not. All right. It would do a bit of a job of an astronomy for a while, actually, because when it does go, it's going to be brighter than the moon, or about as bright as the moon. And so the kind of astronomy I do, I tend to do away from full moon. Um, and it's going to be like having another bright light up there that's as, almost as bright as the full moon. So for a year or so, the kind of astronomy I like doing is going to be quite hard to do because there'll be this new bright light in the sky. Well, Elon Musk will have ruined the sky by then. So. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So, and, and I'm, you know, for, for the dramatic, for the drama of I'm getting to see a star blowing up, I'm prepared to put up with not doing my kind of astronomy for a year, I think. You said you'd be willing to put money on it not being in your lifetime. Yeah. They should run markets on astronomy events, don't they? <laughs> they don't really ever do that, do they? I've never like you can bet on everything, can't you? You can bet on who's going to be the next prime minister and who's going to be that. They should have bets on astronomical events. And I bet you could, you know, if you wanted to. I'm sure your local bookie would be able to figure out some odds for you if you wanted to. I actually have an astronomical bet which has been running, and I don't actually know. I don't know where the betting slip is. So I'm going to have to find it one of these days. Which is that I put a bet that they would find life on Mars years and years and years ago. And, and it was quite an interesting process, actually, because I, I went to the bookmakers and they obviously they couldn't do anything there and then, but then they, they, they have specialists, right? And they put you in touch with their specialists. 
and I had a chat with a specialist. I had assumed that they would like insist there being some time limit, you know, that you find life on Mars sometime in the next 10 years, because otherwise it's just a bet that goes on and on forever. But actually it turns out they don't care because they get to keep your money until the bet's settled. So I have this bet that they will find life on Mars. And there were various criteria, like it had to be non-microscopic and those kinds of things, so bacteria wouldn't count and those kinds of stuff. Um, so what were you thinking? You weren't thinking little green men. I, I reckon, the, well, I, I, I didn't know what I was thinking, really. I just thought it was a fun thing to find out whether you could put a bet on finding life on Mars or not, rather than actually thinking they'd find anything. Um, and I think, I, I'm trying to remember the exact terms, it didn't actually have to be alive, so they could find like fossil remains. So as long as it wasn't like microscopic, then, uh, then it were, I would win the bet. But I'll have to find the betting slip one of these days to find out. Do you think you're going to lose that bet or do you still think you might win that is I, a winning? I reckon there's still a chance. I reckon, yeah, it's, it'll, it'll, maybe it'll pay off. <laughs> I don't reckon. I don't reckon. You know, I think, no. uh, you know, Mars was a much nicer place a long time ago. And, you know, there was water around, there was an atmosphere. And so, you know, who knows? Maybe there was life. When Beetlejuice does go, yes. do we know, any, is there anything, it, will we get any clues that it's about to go? We will get a little bit of warning. So I was, I was intrigued by this in that I heard various stories about whether we get any advance warning or not. And the answer is we will. And so I found a paper that was published a couple of years ago. Neutrinos from beta processes in a pre-supernova, probing the isotopic evolution of a massive star. They do a, a calculation of what the last few hours of a star's life is like just before it goes supernova. And remember the way a star is powered is it burns the various uh, chemical elements from one to the next. So by nuclear fusion, it will turn hydrogen into helium and then helium into carbon and so on up, creating heavier and heavier elements. And the problem with doing that, if you're a star, is that each time you get less and less bang for your buck. You know, each, the, the hydrogen to helium process is, you get quite a lot of energy out. Helium to carbon a bit less and so on. And each time you get less and less energy out which means that in order for the star to kind of hold itself up, it has to burn things at an ever more frantic rate in order to do so. So the last stages of burning are really very intense, but not very energetic. They don't actually produce much energy and they don't last very long because it uses up the fuel very, very quickly. And so this is looking at those last few stages and asking, you know, what are the processes? And actually more importantly, is there anything we could detect that would tell us that those processes were going on? And in particular, the thing that will get straight out from the star are the neutrinos. So one of the byproducts of lots of nuclear reactions is that you produce these pathetic little particles called neutrinos. Basically, whenever you turn a neutron into a proton or a proton into a neutron in some process, um, you tend to produce one of these neutrinos. And neutrinos are such wimpy little particles that they'll actually travel straight through the star. Um, and, and so they, they don't really care. There's a whole body of a star around it. So any neutrinos that are produced will stream straight out. And what these guys did is they did some calculations as to say how many of these neutrinos are there. And in those last few frantic hours when you're burning all these things as quickly as you possibly can, it turns out the processes are so intense you make a lot of neutrinos. So a star spends all that time burning fuel mm -hmm. and over millions of years, but the final fuel event is something measured over hours. Hours, yes, literally hours. So it, and it really is that frantic that it's desperately trying to stay alive. And so it's using up all the fuel it possibly can. It's quite it's, sad almost. It, it, it's a bit pathetic, really. It's like um, it's drowning. Yeah, no, it really, it's uh, this frantic, oh my God, oh my God, I've got to keep going. You know, and it keeps burning all these things and eventually, you know, it just runs out of things to burn. So they do these calculations, they figure out how many neutrinos get produced. And so here they are, this is the number of neutrinos being produced per second. And so the, they did a couple of calculations, 15 solar masses and 30 solar masses. Betelgeuse is around, probably around 10, but this, so this is reasonably close to the kind of thing that would be going on in Betelgeuse. And you can see this is the luminosity in the number of these things being produced per second. And you can see as it's coming up towards the end here, these curves are all going up and up and up and up. So this is one hour before the thing goes, we're looking at 10 to the 52 neutrinos being produced per second. So it's a huge number of neutrinos. Then of course they spread out through space, so by the time they get to the Earth, there's many fewer of them, and then you need a neutrino detector, and that's a hard thing to do because neutrinos just pass straight through everything, and so stopping neutrinos, detecting neutrinos is a hard thing to do, but we have some neutrino detectors on Earth, and they're mostly designed to do things like detect neutrinos from the sun, but it turns out that we might actually hope to detect some of these using the Earth-bound neutrino detectors. So they go through that bit of the calculation as well to figure out what you'd actually expect to see. So they looked at various neutrino detectors. June and Juno don't actually exist yet. 
So they're ones that are being built at the moment. Super Cameo Conda is one that does exist now. And they add up all the neutrinos you'd expect to detect and they reckon you detect slightly less than half a neutrino, which doesn't sound too promising until you realize that this calculation was done assuming a star that was about five times further away than Betelgeuse is. And so the number of new, so the neutrinos spread out through space, they kind of fill the whole area, which means that the number of neutrinos you detect decreases as one over the distance squared. So if the thing's five times closer, that means you see 25 times as many neutrinos. So a half a neutrino turns into about 12 neutrinos. That doesn't sound very many, but remember that the only previous time we've detected neutrinos from a supernova was when the supernova went off in 1987 in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And there they got very excited because they detected 10 neutrinos. So this is kind of in the ballpark that people are used to detecting from neutrinos and getting excited about when they detect them. Um, so actually it will sort of set off the neutrino alarms when it happens and they will actually have this advance notice. They even, I think, have some directional information so they'll even know that, that these are neutrinos that came from the general direction of Betelgeuse. Is there a system in place for the detector to tell all the telescopes to swing around and point at Betelgeuse? I'm not sure there is, um, and actually I'm not sure they can process the data that quickly, whether, that, whether it would only, you'd only find out after the fact, which is what happened with Supernova 1987A, they actually only found out afterwards that actually, yes, we did, did detect it in neutrinos. The good news is if it hangs on for a few more years, these other neutrino detectors come online, and you can see that actually where Super Kamiokanda is only detecting half a, a neutrino, the Juno detector will detect 17. So, and again, remember that will go up by a factor of 25 just because it's closer than that. So if we wait around until Juno is online, then we'll detect lots and lots of neutrinos and that really would be a big burst that would be uh, set off some alarms, I suspect. You talk about advance notice, but that's not because anything bad will happen if Betelgeuse blows up. Not to us, no, we're far enough away that actually all you'll see is a nice big bright light in the sky. Um, but it's not, you know, the gamma rays or anything like that aren't gonna kill us from uh, Betelgeuse when it goes. How far? This is a long way away, isn't it? So this is like all stuff in the past. Yes, it's uh, is it 700 light years away. So yeah, it could have gone by now and we might have to wait around for a few hundred years for the event to get to us. The neutrinos travel to Earth at the same speed as light. So like, it's not like the explosion will overtake the neutrinos. No, and in fact, because, and because there'll be neutrinos created in the explosion itself, and again, a really, really big number of neutrinos. So actually, this is the sort of pre-supernova stuff, but when the explosion really goes, there'll be a huge burst of neutrinos. And actually, they will get to us before we see the light, because the neutrinos come streaming straight out. But you've got to have this explosive shock wave has got to work its way through this, uh, the body of the star before we actually see the, the, the light of the supernova. So in fact, when the supernova goes, we'll get a little bit more warning that the neutrinos will arrive before the explosion does. But Earth is safe, so, I mean, something that far away, it's not like that we're going, like there's going to be any warmth heading towards Earth that's going to cook us. Or... No, it really won't. All, as I say, all we'll see is it will be a dramatically bright light in the sky, but nothing's going to fry. How dramatic? Will you see it in the daytime? And... It'll be visible in daytime, it'll be about the same brightness as the moon, so visible in, during the day. Um, for, and I think you'll see it during the day for a matter of weeks or months, and it'll be visible to the naked eye for a year or so. Awesome. Has there ever been a supernova in our galaxy that we've observed? Uh, not in recent times. I mean, there were, there's, so the Chinese records has uh, records of supernovae around a, a thousand years ago. So there have been supernovae in the, in the Milky Way. The like only, Crab Nebula was one of those. The, exactly, the Crab Nebula was one. The only one that sort of in, in recent times was Supernova 1987A, which was in the Large Magellanic Cloud in our near neighbour rather than actually being in our galaxy. Okay. Oh, I'd love to see one. It would be pretty cool. You should call the bookmaker and find out what odds they'll give you. <laughs> On Betelgeuse going, yeah. yeah. Probably not very good at the moment because there's been so much noise about it. You didn't see the picture. You didn't see what Betelgeuse looks like. Oh yeah, like. what's that you've you go. got? Yeah. So here's a picture. This is what Betelgeuse. Just to give you a sense of what a supergiant star actually looks like, this is a picture of Betelgeuse. It's sufficiently big that with the very high resolution uh, uh, telescopes that we have, like the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, where we can see exquisite detail, we can actually make a picture of the disk of the star itself. And that's partly because this telescope can make incredibly high resolution sharp images, but it's partly because the thing's enormous in that somebody's drawn on here what the orbits of the planets in the solar system would be. And you can see that actually it's bigger than the orbit of Jupiter. It's a truly enormous object. The other thing you can see about it is it is a complete mess, right? That actually is not a nice 
uh, uniform sphere. There's a bright patch over here. There's indications that it's not even exactly round. That's because it is this very sort of churning convective system. It has huge convective cells. There's things rising, things falling, things being spat out. That actually it's a very uh, uh, non-relaxed system. And that, I think, is probably what lies behind the current fading, that there's one of these phenomena going on that's just, maybe it's spat out a load of dust or something, that, which is currently obscuring it. So we're, all we're currently seeing is just some, one of these processes that's going on in the outer layers of the star, um, which just, just made it fade in this rather dramatic way. Do stars this big have planetary systems, as I understand them? Like, do they? Uh, if this one, I mean, it might have had, remember, this is in its supergiant phase. Before that, it was a, you know, a regular sized star. So if it had a solar system like the Earth, it would have been eaten up by now. So it's somewhere inside Betelgeuse might be like the remains of civilizations. Well fried at this point, I suspect, yes. 